tonight. Toxic than ever. Lahore and Delhi choked by smog as pollution season begins with residents experiencing symptoms that risk heart and respiratory diseases. Seoul provoked. South Korea imposes fresh sanctions on North Korea in response to its launch of a suspected intercontinental ballistic missile. Final sprint. Trump and Harris crisscross key battleground states in the final days leading up to the major election. And Iggy's miracle. An endangered baby penguin is now thriving after veterinarians perform a life-saving surgery. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We are here to bring you key stories across the globe over the weekend and for this Monday and we begin today in the Indian region. High levels of air pollution in India and Pakistan are forcing authorities to take emergency measures with penalties issued in India and school closures in Pakistan. Pakistan's second largest city, Lahore, recorded its highest ever air pollution reading at 1,900 AQI near its border with India on Sunday, according to data from local government and Swiss's IQ Air. On the same day, officials in Pakistan's Punjab province announced measures including a one-week-long closure of primary schools and making 50% of office employees work from home. Delhi in India has been shrouded in thick toxic smog as well, with additional pollution from firecrackers and lights during recent Diwali celebrations. A report by the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago says toxic air can shorten the lives of Delhi residents by 8.5 years. Kami Badenoch has won the race to become the new leader of the United Kingdom's Conservative Party. She vows to return to the party's founding principles and to win back voters after its disastrous election defeat in July. 44-year-old Badenoch won 57% of party members' votes in the final round, beating former Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick. Badenoch has been a Conservative member of Parliament since 2017 and has held several cabinet roles, including Trade Minister. She now takes over from former Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and faces the challenge of bringing back the Tories who suffered a huge defeat in July's general election, where they lost over 200 seats. Badenoch is known as a hardliner with anti-woke values and said the election was lost because the Conservatives talked right but governed left, promising that her party will get back on track and stop acting like Labour. In response to the regime's ICBM launch, South Korea announced a new set of standalone sanctions against North Korea. Eleven Korean individuals and four organizations that have aided in the regime's weapons development and trade and foreign currency earnings have been sanctioned as per the reports. In Korea, were regime official Choi Gwang Su for his alleged involvement in exporting North Korean weapons in Dongbang construction on suspicion of being involved in the regime's dispatch of workers overseas. The foreign ministry pointed out Pyongyang's missile launch on Thursday was a violation of UN Security Council resolutions and that it will work closely with the international community. The restrictive measures will take effect on Wednesday. Iranians staged a mass rally at the premises of the former U.S. embassy chanting slogans against the U.S. military occupation in the Middle East, its hegemony and the Israeli violence. The rally is to mark the 45th anniversary of the former U.S. embassy takeover in Tehran and the National Day of the Fight Against Global Arrogance, also known as the National Student Day. An Iranian protester said that the United States has been threatening Iran for more than 40 years and falsely claimed to provide security to the region, but it has never tried to do so and that their aim is to commit crimes and kill. The protesters also said that with the support and connivance of the United States, Israel continued to provoke other countries, causing regional tensions to escalate. They said that Iran will resolutely safeguard its national interests and not be afraid of U.S. and Israeli threats. 
Safari, another Iranian protester, said that Iran is not a country that seeks war or instigates tension in the region. Iran is a country with a long history and strong strength and that they will not allow countries like the United States to infringe on Iran's national interests, warning of future resistance. Further adding, another protester made sharp remarks that the United States has brought nothing good to every country it set foot on, such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria and others, only leaving behind destruction and displacement. The United States has no good record demonstrating its efforts to establish security. It's because the United States has a history filled with acts of destruction, looting and pillage. A few months after the victory of Iran's Islamic Revolution in February 1979, Iranian university students took over the U.S. embassy building, saying that the embassy was based on documents found in it, planning to overthrow the Islamic Republic and serving as an espionage base for the U.S. government. Iran commemorates the takeover every year by holding nationwide rallies. Now let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now. With only two days until the election day, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump are making their final case to waters, with Trump criticizing Harris on the economy and immigration at a rally in Georgia. The presidential race appears to be hurtling towards a photo finish, with the final set of polls by the New York Times and Siena College finding former President Donald J. Trump erases Vice President Kamala Harris's lead in Pennsylvania and maintains his advantage in Arizona. It has been decades since the polls have shown the nation facing a presidential race that is so close across so many states, in both the Sun Belt and the Rust Belt. The tightly contested landscape means the race remains highly uncertain as the campaign enters its final hours. Donald Trump has, however, improved his standing in numerous states, even as late deciding voters appear to be breaking for Kamara Harris. The poll suggests the race is still gaining momentum as more than 75 million people have already voted. Dueling strategies from the two campaigns appear to be the case when Harris, in her closing remarks, has promised to continue arming Israel with her Republican rival, Donald Trump, also holds a staunchly pro-Israel record. Trump makes claims of election fraud in Pennsylvania, where his opponents have accused the former president of using his rallies to stoke suspicion over the election process. Over in Oklahoma in the US, multiple people were injured after severe weather and possible tornadoes tore through the state. More severe weather is expected in the southern plains as residents in Oklahoma survey the destruction caused by the storms. Tornadoes tearing through Oklahoma, carving a path of destruction. Heavy winds and rain decimating neighborhoods this morning, flipping cars and leaving tens of thousands without power. The National Weather Service confirming at least five preliminary tornadoes across Oklahoma, Texas and New Mexico. State officials reporting some residents were rescued from the rubble and at least 11 people were taken to hospitals with injuries. There have been no reported deaths. This is one of the areas with the worst damage. You can see vehicles slamming into these homes, total destruction here, and even a transmission tower falling onto that house. Even the pictures that was up here. In Oklahoma there. City, Tamara but, Shaver and her family oh, say they're lucky to be alive today after most of their home was wrecked. Across the street, their neighbor Anthony Manzana says he was able to run into his bathroom just in time. Residents bracing for more possible tornadoes, high winds and severe weather overnight. Over in the Middle East, the new school year is starting in Lebanon despite ongoing strikes from Israel, with some schools partially transformed into shelters for those displaced by the war. Administrators and teachers are doing what they can to prepare for the arrival of the new pupils. It's a school like almost a thousand others in Lebanon. Nariman is its headmistress. It opened its doors to house those who have been forced onto the streets. In Lebanon, one in four people have fled their homes. 
This room used to be the staff room, and as we have refugees in the other rooms, we're going to equip the whole room with tables and chairs so that our pupils can study. We've already put up the blackboard. Staff are doing what they can to save the school year. Here, around 60 nursery school children will be living with around 50 refugees. They'll be on separate floors. Not everyone may be lucky enough to get a teacher. But the prospect of returning to how life was before seems like a distant reality, as the IDF presses ahead with its offensive and the death toll from Israeli strikes on Lebanon continues to mount. Meanwhile, the death toll from Israeli airstrikes on Lebanon since the beginning of the Israeli Hezbollah conflict in last October had reached almost 3,000, with injuries rising to more than 13,000. The United Nations Office for Coordination of Human Affairs said in its latest report that due to Israel's continued airstrikes and bombings, the humanitarian situation in Lebanon today is more severe than it was in 2006, when a major conflict between Lebanon and Israel broke out. Imran Reza, who served as the United Nations Special Coordinator for Lebanon, condemned attacks against civilians and infrastructure and called on all parties to the conflict to immediately cease hostilities and protect the people. The OCHA said in its report that the Israeli army had repeatedly asked people in Baalbek in eastern Lebanon, Nabatieh in the south and the southern suburbs of the capital Beirut to evacuate before launching airstrikes on these areas. The report said as key infrastructure such as medical institutions have been damaged by airstrikes, many hospitals are overloaded and some hospitals are facing a shortage of blood supplies, urgently needing blood donations to cope with the surge in the number of wounded. Previously, due to the continued airstrikes by the Israeli army, arrangements for the delivery of aid supplies to Baalbek had to be postponed, and medical supplies provided to Lebanon by other countries were also forced to be postponed due to frequent attacks near the airport. Moldova's pro-EU president Maya Sandu has claimed a second term after a tenth election runoff, seen as a choice between Europe and Russia. Maya Sandu applauded by her supporters as she took the lead in Moldova's presidential election. Claiming victory, the pro-EU president stated that her main goal is to be a leader for everyone. A blow for her challenger, Alexander Stoyanoglu, who had taken an early lead. As partial results came in, Stoyanoglu, who was running for the pro-Russian Socialist Party, told his supporters not to panic. According to authorities, bomb scares briefly interrupted voting in Moldova, as well as several polling stations abroad, including in the UK and Germany. Sunday's votes took place amid allegations of Russian interference. According to the Presidential National Security Advisor, Moscow had organised buses and flights to transport voters to polling stations. There was no immediate comment from the Kremlin, which has rejected previous accusations of meddling. The election has been viewed as a choice between Russia and Europe. It came two weeks after a referendum on the country's EU membership aspirations had delivered a narrow win on the same day as the first round. As tragedy hit Spain, protests erupted as Spain's King Philippe visited a suburb in Valencia, badly hit by last week's deadly floods. Residents of the city shouted murderers at the King and Queen, as well as Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez. People hurled mud and other objects at them, venting pent-up anger over what they believe were poor handling by the authorities of last Tuesday's storm and flooding. It was known and nobody did anything about it, a young man told Felipe. The king stayed despite the chaos to speak with the people. He was seen hugging some residents and at one point had a man crying on his shoulder. Residents are furious at the authorities, accusing them of sending late warnings about the dangers of the storm and floods. They also say emergency services responded slowly after disaster struck. The central government has said issuing alerts to the population is the responsibility of regional authorities. Valencia's officials have said they acted as best they could with the information available to them. Prime Minister Sanchez said on Saturday that any potential negligence would be investigated later. The death toll from the country's worst flash floods in modern history edged higher on Saturday. Almost all have been in the Valencia region and especially Pai Porta. But it's still expected to rise, with dozens of people still unaccounted for, while some 3,000 households remained without power, officials said.
With the floods causing extensive damage to the region, many local residents are now coming together to rebuild their communities. Here in Chiva, about 19 miles from Valencia, many people were seen helping to clear mud and debris off the streets, while others signed up as volunteers to hand out food, water and other essential supplies. It comes as thousands of additional troops and police joined the disaster relief effort over the weekend in the largest such peacetime operation in Spain. The tragedy is so far Europe's worst flood-related disaster in a single country since 1967, when around 500 people died in Portugal. Now a short commercial break, more world news on the other side. Welcome back. Iggy the penguin had a slipped ankle tendon, a very serious injury for a penguin, but a team of specialists were able to fix his slipper. The California Academy of Sciences has about 20 African penguins, but recently a lot of attention has been getting paid to a very special one in the group named Iggy. As you can see here, about eight weeks into his life, Iggy could barely walk. This was because of an issue that has become sadly more common for the ankle tendons of this endangered species. Senior veterinarian Dr. Freeland Dunker says a lot of the time this problem can be life-threatening if the penguin can't waddle or swim. Already? So at first he tried giving Iggy this little boot here. Quick! Quick up! Which did stabilize the tendon for a bit, but Dr. Dunker knew surgery was inevitable. After consulting with their colleagues in the industry, Dr. Dunker and a small animal surgeon named Dr. Kim Tong settled on trying a newer technique. I don't want to get too graphic here, but it involved a screw, a washer, and the placement of said screw and washer in a different spot than other surgeons had tried before. Oh my God. <laughs> and as you can tell by this video of Iggy's first swim three weeks after that surgery, the screw washer different placement technique was a tremendous success. After months of rehab, Iggy can now walk around again with his penguin pals. And considering African penguins' numbers have dwindled to below 10,000 pairs in the wild, being able to help these little guys in captivity like Iggy feels very important for the team. And finally tonight, the Los Angeles Dodgers baseball team celebrated its World Series victory with a parade in downtown LA. Following the Dodgers' four games to one win over the New York Yankees, the baseball team secured its eighth title on Thursday in a public parade which had been denied when they last won the title in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. The 2024 World Series MVP, Freddie Freeman, rode on top of one of the several double-decker buses, greeting fans who shouted his name. And with that, we wrap up today's bulletin. Join us again tomorrow for the latest updates from around the world. Until then, thank you for watching and have a great night.